Today I'll talk about Schottky diodes, which are metal semiconductor junctions, and their use in rectification, which is the nonlinear, one-way conduction of current through a device. I'll start by talking about the energy level diagram for a metal n-type semiconductor junction, unbiased that it's in thermal equilibrium. Without bias, the Fermi energy is just a horizontal line all the way across the junction from the metal side through the semiconductor side. There is no quasi-Fermi energy level, which we're going to get to next, when we bias the junction. The band structure on the semiconductor side includes the valence band edge, E sub V, below which holes are mobile, and the conduction band edge, E sub C, at energies above that, you have electrons that are mobile. The bands bend as the interface is approached, and they bend upward for an n-type material, and the conduction band edge has to meet the interface at Q phi sub B n. Q is the electron charge. Phi sub B n is the Schottky barrier height. And it is unique to the combination of metal and semiconductor. For example, silicon and platinum being a common combination of metal has one value for phi sub B n. The Schottky barrier potential is the height of the hill that electrons go up as they travel from left to right towards the interface. If this were a p-type semiconductor, the bands would bend downward, but they would still meet the interface at an energy Q times phi sub BP below the Fermi level. E sub BP is the barrier height for holes. That's the energy band diagram for an unbiased metal semiconductor junction. Now let's place a biased voltage across the junction. A battery of voltage V has its negative terminal attached to the n-type semiconductor material and from that you realize a forward biased junction. It's forward biased because you put that negative terminal on the n-type, the negative potential applied to this n-type semiconductor will chase the electrons into the metal and they'll be able to go around clockwise in a circuit. Reverse bias would be the opposite. If you put the positive terminal of the battery on the n-type, it would attract the electrons from the metal into the n-type region, giving rise to a depletion layer at the interface which sets up space charge at the metal semiconductor interface. The effect of the bias voltage on the metal semiconductor junction is that it raises these energy bands because the negative potential on the semiconductor raises the potential energy of electrons in the semiconductor since they don't like to be around negative voltage. So the bands bend up with a few key constraints, one of which is conduction band edge still has to meet the junction at a energy Q phi sub B n above the Fermi energy of the metal. So as a result, the hill that electrons have to climb in order to get over the junction becomes less steep. The Fermi energy is well defined inside the metal, and so the energy level of the conduction band edge at the interface then is also very well defined as the Fermi energy raised by this amount of Q phi sub B n. The bias voltage has no influence whatsoever on this potential difference at the interface. With the reduced bending, the electrons have less of a barrier across, and so they can more easily make it into the metal side because they don't have to climb such a high hill. Something else you see when you apply this voltage is a splitting in the Fermi level. Now there's still the Fermi energy level in the metal, which is very well defined, but in the semiconductor, you have this quasi-Fermi level, E sub Fn, which is the Fermi level experienced by the conduction electrons. The Fermi level in the semiconductor doesn't change for the minority carriers, the holes, but for the electrons, it shifts up. The quasi-Fermi level is raised above the metallic Fermi level by the amount of bias, V, times Q, because it's an energy. Two important things to note about this effect of voltage on the band structure is one, the point where the conduction band edge meets the interface remains Q times phi sub B n. That is completely unchangeable. And the second is that the valence band edge 
bends by the same amount that the conduction band edge bends, the bias voltage does not affect the band gap of the semiconductor, so they always follow each other. Another point I want to make is that the electrons still don't have enough energy to get over the barrier. In order for the electrons to flow effortlessly into the metal, the applied voltage actually needs to raise that conduction band edge all the way up to phi sub bn. Otherwise, there's still a hill to climb, and the voltage of the battery is not getting the electrons over that hill. They still need thermal energy to completely get over the hill. So it's still by thermal activation that electrons are able to cross the barrier. If you turn the battery around and place the positive terminal of the battery on the n-type semiconductor, the junction becomes reverse biased. Now you are decreasing the energy level inside the semiconductor because you're putting positive voltage on the semiconductor. Electrons like to be there, so the energy is lower. That means the bands bend down instead of up. Just like in the forward bias case, in the reverse bias case, the bands bend down by the amount of applied voltage. Now the quasi-fermi level is the applied potential below the metal's fermi energy. And with the conduction band still having to meet the interface at Q phi sub bn, the hill becomes much steeper than in the forward biased case. With such a steep hill to climb to go from the semiconductor to the metal from left to right, it's highly unlikely that any electron will make it from the semiconductor into the metal. However, electrons can still climb the Schottky barrier potential phi sub bn and move from the metal into the semiconductor. And that's an important thing to note because that amount of jumping over the barrier does not change as we play around with the bias voltage level. You will always have some electrons that can go from left to right in this energy diagram. Because the physical meaning of the Schottky barrier potential is it's the energy that electrons have to overcome in order to flow from the metal into the semiconductor. The Fermi energy in the metal is the highest energy of conduction electrons, and it is the energy of any conduction electrons that travel into the semiconductor. For this reason, when reverse biased, electron movement from the metal to the semiconductor does not depend on the bias voltage and is therefore constant which explains the reverse bias characteristic of diodes. For a p-type semiconductor, it's a very similar description. It's just that the band bending is downward toward the interface rather than upward. We can use these energy band diagrams to come up with a really useful expression because these diagrams are filled with well-defined quantities. The Schottky barrier height is well-defined, the voltage that you apply is certainly well defined, and so consequently the height of the quasi Fermi level above the Fermi level of the metal is well defined. The band gap is well defined. So if I look at these diagrams, I can surmise an important relation. And this relation that I'm about to put up here is correct for both the forward biased and reverse biased case, but it's easier to see in the forward bias, so let's look at that. Would you agree that this energy difference at the interface between the conduction band edge? and the quasi-Fermi level equals the Schottky barrier potential energy minus the applied potential energy. So let's write that down as an equation, and it will become a working equation that we're going to make use of right now as we derive the Schottky diode relation that we all rely on to model the IV characteristics of diodes. We reasoned this expression by looking at these values at the interface, and so that's technically where it is valid, but that's good. Let's keep things to the interface because that's a well-defined place with well-defined quantities. This is actually enough understanding to come up with a Shockley diode expression that we rely on pretty heavily whenever we talk about diodes, and we're going to do it with the context of the metal semiconductor junction, but we will be able to leave out the non-ideality factor eta the non-ideality factor is there to account for electron hole recombination at the interface. A Schottky diode is made up from either n-type or p-type semiconductor, and so only one type of carrier, electrons or holes, are present. So there is no electron hole recombination, therefore eta equals 1 for the metal semiconductor junction. 
Schottky diodes and PN junction diodes can be contrasted, especially by that presence of bipolar versus one type of carrier PN junctions needing both electrons and holes, and hence having non-ideality. Other distinctions can be concluded from looking at the typical IV characteristics. So we have the metal semiconductor junction and the PN junction IV characteristics, and a couple of things can be seen right away. First is that the metal semiconductor junction has a much larger reverse bias current, but on the flip side, the metal semiconductor junction passes much more current for a given voltage than does a PN junction. And that makes a metal semiconductor Schottky diode useful for high-speed circuits because you can get that current out really fast to charge up the capacitances in your CMOS. And that low voltage drop that you see at a given current for a Schottky diode makes it a better choice of a rectifying element for low voltage circuits. Because there's still a hill, electrons still need thermal energy to get over the little bit of a hump. Thermal energy is kinetic energy, and the velocity of the electrons can be understood from kinetic theory. If you think of the electrons as a gas, the Maxwell-Boltzmann speed distribution can be relied upon to give an expression for the average velocity of electrons in the semiconductor. It's fairly accurate provided you use the conductivity effect of mass because, for sure, the electrons in a metal aren't, say, a gas of molecules, but they behave like a gas provided the effective mass is used. If you've already taken a statistical mechanics course, you're well aware then of how velocity increases with temperature as a square root. In other words, the kinetic energy of the electrons in the semiconductor increases linearly with temperature, and that kinetic energy is exactly what the electrons need to still get over the barrier. Although the electrons do travel from the semiconductor into the metal with a pretty generous voltage assist, they nevertheless need to overcome that barrier, and they have to do that on their own. The voltage that's supplied across the junction doesn't get the electrons over the barrier. It gets them to this height. So I'm not going to characterize the current crossing the junction as drift current, but rather it remains a diffusion-controlled process. Now when there's any kind of charge transport, the current density is given by the product of carrier density times the elementary charge unit times the average thermal velocity that we just discussed. The carrier density can be found in any book on semiconductors. It's a exponential relation of the separation between the conduction band edge and the quasi-Fermi level over kT, k being Boltzmann's constant, t being temperature. N sub c is often referred to as the effective density of states, just for lack of a better name. We do have an expression for it. It's temperature dependent, and I'll put that out here in a second. So we just came up with this little equation looking at the energy band diagrams that related the conduction band edge, the quasi-Fermi level, the applied voltage, and the Schottky barrier voltage. So you may want to go back and look at that expression and then look at this again and recognize EC minus E sub Fn as being equivalent to Q phi sub Bn minus QV. So I'll make that change and have this more practical expression. Quasi-Fermi level is not a practical quantity, but applied voltage certainly is. For V, we'll use that expression I just provided for the Maxwell-Boltzmann speed distribution. So the average velocity being root 2 kT over pi times the effective mass. This is the expression for N sub C, the effective carrier concentration. What I would point out is the temperature dependence is fairly strong. It's temperature to the three halves, everything else being a constant. I want to pull out E to the minus V over kT into a separate factor. So I have E to the QV over kT and everything else I'm going to group. Everything else except this very last exponential is a constant as long as you are at constant temperature. You have the effective mass, you have Boltzmann's constant, you have Planck's constant, and you have the temperature and the Schottky barrier height. As long as temperature is a constant, now if the temperature changes, this will change. But let's just call this a coefficient at for the time being. So current I, which is current density times cross-sectional area through which the current flows, is this. I included then a factor of area 
I'm going to rewrite it as just an amplitude times e to the q v over k t. I sub zero of t. I will continue to drag along that temperature dependence. Presuming you operate at room temperature, you have a value for that. And I sub zero is calculated at the interface. If we go back and look at it, we're using all parameters from the interface, the conduction band edge, quasi-Fermi level, the Schottky barrier potential. Everything has to do with the interface, and that's okay because conservation requires that whatever current you calculate at the interface is also the current that you find deeper inside the semiconductor. Figure everything out at the interface if you can, because at that point, all the variables that you need, such as V sub Bn and V and E sub C and E sub Fn, are locked down and known. And maybe by writing of T on that I sub zero, we keep reminding ourselves that it's thermal activation that drives current over the junction in this device. If you look at this expression for the current, you might realize that it can't be the whole story. When voltage V is zero, I should be zero. You can't get current without voltage. And yet this expression says that when voltage is zero, I equals I sub zero. So something's still not complete. Not wanting a magical junction that gives you current with no voltage, you can fix the problem by subtracting from this whole expression I sub zero. That is, subtract the current that this expression tells you is there when V equals zero. That would certainly work, and in fact, it's the right thing to do. But it's also worth providing some rationale for why we would do that. Remember my description of a reverse bias junction. Electrons can cross from the metal into the n-type semiconductor by going up a potential level of phi sub bn, which they can only do by thermal agitation. They're not driven to do that by the applied voltage. So this backwards conduction from the metal into the semiconductor is the same at all voltage levels. So when you do reverse bias this junction, you still have backwards current flow and it is independent of the voltage level. And that's in fact what we have at negative voltage. If we modify our expression by subtracting I sub zero from it, now at V equals zero, you have one minus one, so the total current is zero, as it should be. And when voltage is negative, this exponential becomes negligible, and you have a current of minus I sub zero, which does not depend on the voltage, at least for sufficiently large negative volts. And then for positive voltage, this minus one becomes negligible, and we have this behavior back again. And so this is the model for a diode. We apply it to both Schottky diodes and the PN junction diodes. It's just that with a PN junction diode, you might have to account for the non-ideality with that non-ideality factor eta. And just remember the junction is forward biased when you have a positive potential on the metal and the lower potential on the semiconductor. And that's when V is a positive number. If you put the higher potential on the semiconductor and the lower potential on the metal, that's when V voltage is a negative number. The next two lectures will give us an application of metal semiconductor junctions. We will look at ohmic contacts and compare and contrast them to Schottky diodes, both of which are metal semiconductor junctions. But before we can do that, we need to stop and talk a little bit about quantum mechanical tunneling in the very next lecture. And then after the next two lectures, we will be ready to move into MOS structures. If you want to, you could skip ahead to the MOS capacitor lecture and move on from there. So I'll see you in whichever lecture you go to next.